I'm gonna hit record. Um, I'm gonna take all this away. Uh, you guys keep doing it, and then whenever you start, I'll just okay. I'll, I'll just be talking, and we're ready, and, and we cool. can edit. And yeah. If I, if I start, you know. That's correct. If I start speaking in tongues, you can sell it to, uh, you know, Christian Broadcasting Network or something. So that'll be. That's great. correct. Cool. I'm very popular on that. <laughs> Where's your wife? Well, I, I have to get my hair a little bigger. We know? are so yeah. we are so excited to have Stephen Womack with us here tonight. Stephen is a native of Nashville, and he's a writer extraordinaire. It's uh, it's just a joy. I, I must tell you, I've, I've started reading his books as of late, and I have to put eye drops in because I'm thinking my eyes are hurting, but I can't stop. So. He's fabulous. Stephen holds a Master of Fine Arts in English and Writing from Southampton College Writing Program. He did his undergraduate work at Tulane, and uh, he started publishing articles back as an undergraduate. He began his first novel when he was 18. His first published novels, Murphy's Fault, was the only first mystery named to the 1990 New York Times Notable Books list. Now, 13 novels later, Stephen Womack continues writing fiction that garners similar critical accolades. Six of the novels published by Womack have received national recognition, including the highest award presented to writers in the field of mystery and crime fiction. He is famous for this detect his, his detective series about Harry James Denton, and I'm secretly very much in love with Harry James Denton after reading these books. <laughs> He is, he's a, he's a great character. I love him. The third of this series, Dead Folks Blues, which I'm reading now, was presented the 1994 Edgar Allan Poe Award as Best Original Paperback Novel by the Mystery Writers of America. I could go on and on and on, but we want to save some time to hear from the man himself. So welcome. Thank you so much. Thank you. Really, really. Well, Pleasure to be here. Well, it's, it's great to have you, and uh, this is our third in, uh, in in this series, and we're just so happy to have you. And thanks to Elaine Aldis, our friend, who says, "Let me tell you about a great writer and my neighbor." And we said, "Yes, sign us up." So, thank you. And you're welcome. Thank you, Elaine. Well, I just have a few questions, and we can veer off in any direction that that where you're led, but. When did you, I know you wrote your first novel at 18, but when did you first decide to be an author? Was there a particular book, an event, or a person, like the first book that made you cry or, or anything like well, that? I, I owe a lot of it to my parents because they read to me as a child. Oh. They encouraged me to read. Um, my grandparents, I, I read all the time. I spent a lot of time with my grandparents growing up. And, and I just grew up in an environment where I was reading all the time. And that really is how writers get started. And I, you know, I, uh, I had a teacher in, I wanna say, eighth grade, who assigned us uh, to journal. And I had never done anything like that before. I never kept a diary before. But I got into the assignment and what she was doing and I started journaling and, you know, I turned in 40 or 50 oh. pages the first time around, and, and she, this teacher, reacted to it very well. It was very encouraging. So I had some, you know, I had some, some mentors and some guidance as a child. Um, read a lot of the classics. Grew up reading Twain, Edgar Allan Poe, um, you know, the stuff that you read in, in early in school, and, and just got caught up in it. And then in the 60s, and I'm an old guy, so I go back that I think far. we're the same age. I, You're very young. I find that hard to believe. <laughs> it's but, the truth. <laughs> um, I, got, I got a scholarship to a boarding school, That's and I got sent away to a boarding school in upstate Ohio, and um, I had an English teacher there uh, who was intense, uh, as most of the teachers were. It was a very competitive, um, highly academic, it's kind of a demanding place. And um, he assigned us to read Robert Penn Warren's All the King's Men, which I don't know if you've read the book. I think it's the great American novel of the 20th century. I think it was college. 
when yeah. Lincoln did it. Yeah, and, and we thought he was absolutely out of his mind because it's a doorstop of a book. It's a huge book. <laughs> a he, is, he assigned us to read 25 pages a night, and we Ooh. thought he was out of his mind. And I opened up the book, and I started reading it, and the next thing I know, I, you know, I think I had skipped classes for a day, never left my dorm room. Um, it's like when I started reading your books. Well, thank you. <laughs> it's just, the truth. And the truth. I was absolutely blown away by it. It was a life-changing, game-changing experience. Oh. Um, you know, uh, Penn Warren's uh, uh, character, Jack Burden, to, spoke to me. He's a, he's, he was very smart, but he was very cynical, very disillusioned. Um, All the King's Men, which is, of course, loosely based on the life story of Huey Long, mm -hmm, the, mm -hmm. the, the famous populist governor right. of Louisiana. Um, it just drew me into the story, and I read the book from start to finish, and opened it up to page one and read it again. And oh my goodness, and what a I great have story. now six copies of it at home, three of which are signed, and it was oh my two, or three, two or three of which are signed. And um, it's just, it. I remember thinking at, you know, 16 years old, I want to do. I want to do to other people what this guy just did to me, oh. which is pull you into another world, take you out of this world, send you off into a place you've never been, and you just get lost. And I've been doing it ever since. Um, I, I decided to take a gap year between college and high school and college, and that wound up being a gap semester because I got a job in a factory. And nothing will get you into college. Get <laughs> a job in a factory. I get it. So I was working second shift in a factory, getting off early enough to go to the local pub and have a couple of three two beers, which is what you could get in Ohio if you were eighteen. Right. right. And then going home and writing all night, sleeping till noon, and getting up and going in for my second shift. And you know, I finished the book. It, it was not any good. Um, it's not been published. Um, and what was it called? What was it called? It had some weird working title, The Eagle Pursuit, or something like that. <laughs> and it was, it was this sprawling, epic, you know, thing that I wrote entirely as self-indulgence. Uh, I didn't bring any craft to it. I just came home and scribbled all night long in spiral notebooks. And then I uh, uh, went off to college. I fancied myself an actor because I'd been in a couple of plays in high school. How fun. And I got down to Tulane where they have a real theater department. And um, I got down there in an academic, highly competitive theater department. And I realized that that scared the hell out of me. And <laughs> I suffered from stage fright. So I decided to go back to the writing process and get behind the scenes again. And that's where I've been ever since. Um, you know, and I, I, I wrote, to the best of my knowledge, I wrote five novels and couldn't give one away. And um, I had maybe seven or eight more that were in progress or died on the vine. And this was in the 70s. Um, I graduated from college, uh, wandered around for a little bit, um, tried to break into journalism. I, had a, I was a newspaper reporter in New Orleans. Mm -hmm. um, I worked for um, Durer and Cheek mm -hmm. at United mm -hmm. Press International in the 70s. And, but even back then, uh, as far back as the mid to late 70s, journalism was a dying profession. Mm -hmm. It was getting harder and harder mm -hmm. to get jobs, to get decent jobs, to make a living. And of course that's continued on now to this day to where print journalism as we grew up with it it barely exists anymore, which I think is a great tragedy. Oh, yeah. But there's not much we can do about it. You know, the largest newspaper chain in America, Gannett, mm -hmm. is a penny stock now. And, and what was it at one time? I oh, I, I don't know what it peaked at, but it's, it's a few dollars a share now. And they're yes. laying off, yeah, they're laying off reporters right and left. 
Uh, ten, Nashville was a great newspaper town back in the days, as you know, with the banner in and Tennessee, Tennessee yes. at each other's throats oh, all the time yes. politically. John Siegenthaler, who I had the great pleasure of getting to know eventually. Really? We, uh, the last 10, 12 years of his life, I, um, he had me on a word on words about oh. a half a dozen times. Love and that program. I did too. I did too. And, and John was, was really became one of my heroes. And um, so I was floundering around, moved out of publishing, I mean out of journalism, and into publishing and wound up in New York City working for a publisher up there, but just an obscure publisher nobody's ever heard of. And um, I worked in publishing for a while, but in art departments. Never, I was never an editor. Um, I worked in graphic design, art departments. Oh, interesting. I was a paste-up person back when that still existed. Yes. Nobody pastes up anymore. And um, and at the same time, I was writing and collecting rejection slips right and left. And um, in the mid '80s, um, I was signed. I, I, I left the publishing business in New York City. I was living in a co-op that that co-opted out from under me, and and we. We couldn't afford the co-op, and I was getting burned out anyway. Came back to Nashville, you know, thinking I'd stay a few months, looking for a job, and uh, trying to figure out what to do. Went to work for a publisher um, over here off the, the world's largest Bible publisher is in Nashville. Thomas. Thomas Nelson. <clears throat> and at the time, they were still independent. I worked for Nelson in the 80s. Uh, I ran their in-house art department and type department. And then in the 80s, they, they laid me off. I got laid off. And I got, as I say, I got downsized before downsizing was cool. <laughs> and, and it turned out to be really the best thing that ever happened to me. Corporate life, I always chafed a little bit mm -hmm. at it. I would always wanted to be a full-time writer. And, they, and I got laid off, but I got a nice enough package out of it that I didn't have to rush out and get another job. That's great. And at the same time, I saw an, an ad in the Tennessean for a continuing adult education class in screenwriting. And I went, and it was, you know, the, the, the arrogance of a younger person. I thought, well, I've watched a lot of movies. How we'll call it confidence. Yeah, confidence. <laughs> I've watched a lot of movies. How hard can it be to write one? And I went, oh, boy. <laughs> so I took a class in screenwriting, and that was... For writers, and I would encourage any writer who wants to write novels, to write narrative mm -hmm. fiction, take a screenwriting class because the difference between taking a creative writing class and a screenwriting class is the difference between a knitting circle and marine boot camp. <laughs> I, mean, this, my, my, I had two main screenwriting teachers, and they drilled into me concept of narrative structure. Yes. You know, you don't just you don't just vomit stuff out on a page and and expect it to work. You have to bring some craft and some structure yes. to it. Yes. You have to understand how narrative works. You have to understand what drives story. And what drives story, of course, is what drives people. Mm -hmm. Story is our lives and what drives people. So um, you know people are <laughs> <clears throat> Excuse me, as most of us know, you know, most of us are driven by desire. Mm -hmm. We want something. Mm -hmm. We go after it. Mm -hmm. Something stands in the way of us getting it. Conflict results. We get into conflict with people. And of course, that's how stories get, con get started with conflict. People want something, they don't get it. I so they do something else to go after it. Yes. And to give you an idea uh, of what a game changer this was, um, I had written a book called Murphy's Fault, which you very kindly mentioned. It had been turned down by 22 publishers over the course of five or six years. Couldn't, couldn't give it away. And I stuffed it away in a file cabinet, basically forgot about it. Fast forward 10 or 12 years, uh, I'm so desperate to get published, I've written a romance novel. <laughs> Oh, I want to read this. We can make that happen. <laughs> um, although I'm sure it needs a lot of work. I haven't looked at it in years. But I wrote a romance novel, which got me a literary agent. Only he couldn't sell the novel. So I was afraid he was going to drop me as a client. 
and I uh, so I pulled out this old book that I'd been that had been turned down by everybody, and I rewrote it with what I learned in screenwriting class. Yes, and gave it to this guy. And six weeks later, he called me back, and the first words out of his mouth was "Sit down." Ooh, you gotta love that. And you had me at sit down. And sit down. <laughs> yes, I'll sit down. And um, a, a famous mystery editor, Ruth Cabin, at, at Saint who passed on many years ago, but at the time she was still very active, very prominent, well-known mystery editor, wanted to buy the book. And I was like, there we go. That's and, it, that's a great story. And it, it it and then when it made, you know, most first novels don't sell. Nobody had ever heard of me, and you know. Most still have. No, but, I, I but, disagree. I but um, it was a start. <clears throat> and then when the New York Times named it to their year end list of worthy books, Ruth bought another one. And then there was another one. And, you know, you just get these pivotal things that are in a writer's journey where. Suddenly you turn a corner and there's something new. Oh, there. isn't that exciting? I mean, this is a it's, it's, it's a sort of typical story for writers. Mm -hmm. But I had a book out. Nobody was paying any attention to it whatsoever. I got some nice reviews, but it wasn't selling. And I and a, a writer from West Tennessee, a, a mystery writer named Deborah Adams, who lives down in Waverly, mm -hmm. sweetheart. Deb and I are still friends to this mm -hmm. day. She called me one day and said, my name's Deborah Adams and you don't know me, but I have just published my first novel with Random House and I'm looking for sympathetic local writers who will give me a blurb. And a blurb is where, you know, yes. you, you know yeah. you, you've got this book, my book by Joe Schmo, and then it says, you know, down at the bottom in print, best book ever written, Stephen King. That's and right, that's, that's or Stephen Watt. Or that's a blurb. <laughs> so Deb wanted me to blurb her book, and I said, of course I've never been asked before. It was, it was a thrill. Of course. I read the book. I loved it. It was, this was all the, she did a series of books with all the, in the time, all the crazy mothers. Oh, the, I love that. And, and uh, I forget the title of this book in particular, but it was her first one, and this was 30 years ago. And so I gave her a nice blurb. Well, the next thing I know, her editor, <coughs> excuse me, at Random House, called me to thank me for the blurb and said, I really appreciate it. Always glad to help him see people help other writers. And he said, by the way, Deb sent me a copy of Murphy's Fault. And I read it. And I liked it. And, and he said words which floored me. He said, if you ever want to work together, give me a call. Now, I've been collecting rejection slips. <laughs> Probably have one from him <laughs> for, at this point, a dozen, 15 years. And, um, and, and, he, and now there's this top shelf editor at Random House <laughs> saying, if you ever want to work together, give me a call. So I said, I'll have you something in 30 days. And... <laughs> And he laughed and said, well, don't put any pressure on yourself. Take your time. I said, no, I'll have something in 30 days. Hung up the phone and went, oh, what do I do now? Oh, what, the hell what do did I, I commit now? to? What do I do now? So I went and found this novella that I'd written. Uh -huh. I decided to write a mystery. I'd never really written, but I'd written it years earlier. And to, to give you an idea of my luck placing things, there was, back in the 70s, there have been three or four different renditions of Nashville Magazine. Oh, you know, we I had, went to school with the guys, the guys that started that. Okay, it's so you know I know what I'm talking I, about. I know so, it so I pitched this 60-page novella, which was a murder mystery set on the Vanderbilt campus. And I pitched it to them, and I said, I'll give it to you for free. You can serialize it over several months. And they turned it down. <laughs> I couldn't, literally couldn't give it away. So I took this 65, 70 page novella, which was called Murder at Vanderbilt. <laughs> well, it, it and, tells you what it is. And I, and I rewrote the first three or four chapters, rewrote 
the synopsis for the rest of it, and I sent it in to Joe Blades at Random House, and he bought it. And I, you know, hey, there we go. And, um, and then the book was nominated for an Edgar, which blew everybody away. And the Random House flew me to New York City for the Edgar's banquet, and the book won. And I was like, Staggered, and that 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 was the start of a, a real uh, beginning for me. It took a while. And what year was this? This was 1994. 1994. And again, almost 30 years ago. And um, um, and then he bought another one, and then he bought another one, and we argued over titles. I always struggle with titles. Uh, Dead Folks Blues was not my title. The editor came up with it. Really? Uh, but I liked it, so I went with it. And we did this music-themed, you know, title, and uh, we did a series. And finally, the third one was a murder mystery set in the country music business because this is uh, blasphemy in Nashville. But I'm not a huge, cute country music fan. <laughs> I mean, I like it, <laughs> but you know, I mean, I don't want to get shot going downtown for saying this, but. You know, I didn't know that much about Not it. Your, it wasn't my, I, I like jazz. Right. <laughs> and, and so I, I, you know, I did a lot of research and set a mystery in the music business, which is brutal. It's a brutal business. It is. It and is. so, you know, you just, you, you just started going and things were going great. Those books were uh, uh, optioned for film and television. They were under option for years and years and years. But it's, it's very difficult to get projects like that started, so nothing ever happened. And um, yet, and then towards the end of the 90s, uh, several things happened. I did a realignment, I you know, divorced and remarried, and started a family very late in life. And at the meantime, the Watkins Film School had started. I was teaching their adjunct. Yes. And they offered me a full-time job, so I slid sideways into academia, and I stayed at Watkins for 25 years, teaching screenwriting and film and critical studies, and, and I continued to write, but my output yes. was suffered. And, yes. uh, and those were, uh, there were many difficult years for the publishing industry in general. Oh, yes. And a lot of midless writers who were going gangbusters in the 90s suddenly found themselves without contracts and without gigs. Yes. So probably, I think the book publishing business probably tracked the record industry about five years behind. I was gonna say, I mean, so many people, the, the story is so similar with songwriters. With songwriters and musicians that they would put, um, I made in the 90s, the 80s and the 90s, made some sweet freelance money writing scripts for music videos. I wrote a couple of them and they were great gigs. <laughs> Who was anything? Well, the one that I remember that I, that I had the most fun with, there was a group called Little Texas. Uh -huh. Remember them? Yes, I and did. And they did this ballad, um, this romantic, sweet song. To this day, it brings tears to my eyes, called What Might Have Been. Do you remember title. that song? I can't call it, it up, but I it, love it. It's a great title. It was a story a about title. a guy who meets a woman overseas in World War II during the war, and they fall in love, and they dance, and they have a great time, and they agree to meet up when the war is over and continue their romance. Yes. But of course, they get separated, and they never see each other again. Sixty oh. years later, this guy's... Uh, his grandkids and kids are checking him into an old folks home. No, no. And oh. there she is. And it was just, and the guy who directed the music video was a fellow named Jack Cole. And Jack's philosophy was, the, the, the record company's philosophy was, let's make a music video to sell records. Mm -hmm. Jack's philosophy was, <laughs> Let me take a music video and all that record company money, which at that point they were putting high five and six figures into the music videos. He said, let me make my movie. So he wrote a, he, I wrote a narrative script 
with that song as the score for an eight minute movie. It's still on YouTube. You can still find it. I'm watching it too. And it's, it's just the sweetest love thing. What and might have been. What might have been. It'll just, it'll bring a tear to your eye. Oh, that's a, oh. It's, it's syrupy romantic. Well, but, you gotta love Jack that. Pulled it off. So, that is. You know, and, um, boy, that was a long winded answer to one question. I am sorry. I am in. I am in ecstasy. I love hearing these stories, and you're 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 a great. Well, I started to say you're, you're a great storyteller, but I guess that's what you do, isn't well. it? Well, <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's wonderful. It's Thank absolutely you. wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. I, I love hearing all these stories. It's fun. Fantastic. Oh, it's fantastic. Uh, question, just about your process. What do you do when you're deep into a project and you're just really going at it a hundred percent but then this other idea comes in and you think oh that's really a good idea do you go to the new idea do you stick with this do you just go away for now and write it down or do you change yeah. gears no i can't uh, it, it, a lot of it depends but when when i'm really into a project mm -hmm. you get in this zone where that you just laser off. Yeah. That's all you can think about. And I don't do this anymore because I'm not as young as I used to be. <laughs> but in my younger days, I would just get medieval on it uh -huh. and would work, uh, un, you know, I was finishing, I can't remember what book it was, but it was one of the Harry James Denton books. And uh, I, I, I saw the incoming. I was four or 500 type pages into it, saw the incoming but didn't know exactly when I was going to get finished. And my, my, my wife went to work and I was home alone and I started writing and I don't know what came over me, but I just, I did 22 pages without stopping. And in the middle of it, and I'm sitting here in my desk upstairs, typing away, laser lock, and I had this sudden, overwhelming stabbing pain. And I thought, am I, is this the heart attack gonna finally hit here? And I thought, no, but I'm, let me finish this page, let me finish this, let me get this page, let me finish this. And then I stopped and went, what in the hell is going on? And I realized I had to pee. <laughs> and I had been sitting there for hours with a big mug of coffee, working away and not paying that attention. That is focus, that is not, focus. Not paying the right that is focus. attention. So. Um, <laughs> I'm glad it wasn't a heart attack. I'm glad. That was safer later. Yeah, that was later, later. that was later. But, um, you know, you just, you get into it. Of course, when you're in the middle of, every writer has a different way of, of, attaching, of attacking this and the process. I do loose outlines, big yeah. picture outlines. I mean, I know where the book's going to go. I know where it needs to get. I know how it's going to start. I have an idea of the principal landmarks in the journey. But, but basically, you just, you know, once you get that stuff laid down, you, 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 you have to be open to surprises as well. And sometimes stuff comes to you in the middle of a scene or the middle of a chapter or something. And you go, oh wow, where did that come from? But I'm going to see where that down. goes. Yes, yes. That's yes. a nice surprise. So, you said you knew the middle and da da da. Do you always know the end? Usually, I'm, and I used to. I taught this for many years to my students. If you're the kind of person that can totally, they call it pantsing, where you just outline and go by the seat uh -huh. of your pants. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. If you can do that, more power to you. But most of the writers I've known need to have an idea where the story's going. Yeah. And that usually means how it's going to end. Yes. If it's a mystery, who's the bad guy? Depends on the genre. You know, if you're writing a romance novel, you know, are the people going to be together at the end? Right. You're right. going to get your happy ever after, or are you not going to get your happy ever after? Exactly. So that, for me, it's just a matter of. of doing a lot of groundwork and homework. Um, I'm stuck now on a book because Harry's, the book I'm working on now is, is a 
really a personal book for Harry. And I don't know that there's much I can say about it, but Harry went to college in Boston in the 80s. And then somebody comes back into his life from that time that he hadn't seen in decades. Who, and there's a terrible secret involved. Ooh. And it was somebody that Harry was involved with at one point. In fact, I think I think the tagline for this book in is for, for this book is um, she could have been the love of his life if she lived. So, oh, <laughs> so yeah, Harry's gone, going back in time. But I'm stuck because I don't know how to. I've never, I never lived in Boston. I've been to Boston. Uh, I've got friends from Boston. And early on in that series, I put Harry in college in Boston, and I don't have any idea why. I was just building a backstory for him. Right. And, I'm stuck and, with and that it. is, oh my God. <laughs> and now I'm stuck road with trip, it. So, road trip, road trip. So, and then I, I don't want to want, I don't want to write an extended flashback of Harry back in the 80s with this person. On the other hand, the reader needs to understand that's where it came from, that's where this is all coming from, it's part of his life, it's part of his story. So, so this is in progress right now. This means I'm working on it right now while I'm doing some other projects as well. Interesting. It's, yeah. Well, I can't wait. Oh, I cannot wait. You. Now, um, how much of Harry is you? Wow. Um, you know, Earth, back in the 90s when those books were very popular, people used to ask me that. I always, I never could quite figure that out. Um, Harry's, um, in the books, Harry comes, I think, um, sometimes he's kind of adrift, sometimes he's trying to find mm -hmm. his way. Harry, in fact, is much more better put together than I am. <laughs> um, he's, 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 he's sort of confident, uh, but not overly so. Um, there's a bedrock, ground, fundamental sort of rock to him that he's solid underneath. I don't know that I am. <laughs> I struggle with it. Um, but he, he's, he's very smart, very inquisitive. And But more than anything else, and you're, you're reading the book now, Harry's not a tough guy. He's not Jack Reacher. He's not. Um, he's, he, he solves the mysteries and the crime primary in, primarily with his intellect. He's a smart right. guy. Right. Um, one of the things that I wanted to capture in this film, I, I actually love sort of the old school hard boiled detective fiction. Um, you know, and, and the writers that I love who wrote that stuff, I, I really love them. I can't do it because my take on violence, mm -hmm. um, I mean, you're, if you're reading the book, you know, at one point, Harry gets hit mm -hmm. and he spends the rest of the novel bitching about how much it hurts. Right, you're right. <laughs> you're right. <laughs> you know, it, you know I, 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 I always had a problem with movies and books where, you know, somebody gets hit or they get shot in the shoulder and they go, oh, he just winged me. I interviewed a doctor once who, who, who said that it drove him crazy the way violence is depicted in fiction. He said, if somebody shoots you in the shoulder, you're probably gonna live, but you're never gonna be able to get dressed by yourself again. <laughs> I mean, Interesting. You know, that, that kind of level of violence is devastating to the human body. Yes. And I wanted a, a sense of that. And in one of the other books, um, Harry almost gets killed a couple of times. And I, I tried to write a sense of the terror of it and, mm -hmm. and the, the unbelief that, the, the, yes. oh my God, this isn't really happening. Right. Because, I, you know, I enjoy... Actually, I've never read a Lee Child book. I, people tell me I should read them. Um, but I've seen excerpts from Tom Hanks as Jack Reacher and this new guy, right, the Australian exactly. guy as Jack Reacher. And they're great entertainment, but not anything. I would have trouble writing it because it's the violence is so yeah. cavalier. Well, and, yeah. you know, and I, I got in one fight in high school in boarding school, my roommate, 
I weighed about 120 pounds and my roommate was on the football team. Ooh. And we got to scuffling around one night in our in our dorm room and it got out of hand and he pushed me down on the dorm room floor and leaned over to help me up and I was mad. So I kicked him and jumped up like this and that's the last thing I remember. <laughs> oh, I... He came. Still, all I saw was a, was a fist flying at me, and then this eye socket here exploded. So, yeah, I learned um, very, you know, very early in life, don't fight. That just don't, just don't right, fight. don't fight. Just don't fight. <laughs> you know? Well, Harry is very believable. I mean, he. You're right. He's not the type that would get shot and go, oh, you know. Yeah, I'm just, it just, okay. it's just a flesh wound. Yeah, no, I, yeah, I like. He, he's. Uh, I'm thinking of, uh, yes, some of the, the things on Netflix and all, you're right, it's like people are having all this violence done to them, they just get right up and next project, yeah, it's, it's not It's not real. It's great entertainment, but that's all it is, is entertainment. The, I love so. that doctor, that doctor's remark, but you never get dressed by yourself. Yeah, you're going to need help buttoning your shirt for the rest of your life. That's amazing. <laughs> well, talking more about your process, I found that very interesting. So when you were when you're writing, are you thinking fry text pyramid? I mean, are you, are you thinking falling action? Are you thinking following all the, the conflict? You know, are you thinking about how to? And that came out of studying the, the structure of screenwriting and narrative fiction. Yes. Yeah, that you're you're the 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 whole note. And I used to really try to impress this on my students. Every scene, the, the life's blood of this kind of storytelling is conflict. Yes. Every scene's got to have conflict. Yes. Um, characters, your main characters come into a scene at one place, they leave the scene at another yes. as a result of the conflict and what's taking place in this scene. And what happens in this scene leads to what happens in the next. Because of this, this happened. Because of the cumulative effect of this and this, a third thing happened. And if you just build that up, Yes. And remember, linking the scenes together, pretty soon you're going to... I had somebody once say to me um, at a book signing that I was signing books, and, and the person handed me the book and said, I, I really enjoyed your book, thank you. You're from the one damn thing after another school of plotting, aren't you? And I went, yeah, okay. One, one damn thing after another, that'll do it. And you just pile it on. You just well, whatever you're doing, it's working. Oh, thank you. Well, let me ask you this. Talk about the screenwriting. If you had to describe a perfect, script, the most perfect movie script ever written, what would you say? Ooh, I've got a few. Well, I've you can give few. me five. You can give me ten. I, I, you can give me, well, I'll give you that many. <laughs> um, I used to, all my students um, studied and read uh, Casablanca. Mm -hmm. That's a great script. Uh, and it's a, it's, it's a, in the history of filmmaking, it's, mm -hmm. it's an important script to study yeah. for screenwriters mm -hmm. because there are five separate subplots in Casablanca. Really? If you, if you deconstruct it, there's, there's five different subplots. It's a very complicated, of course it was written by three of the greatest screenwriters who ever lived, the Epstein brothers and Howard Hope. Yeah. And there they were Julius and Philip Epstein, and, and directed by one of the great directors, Michael Curtiz. <coughs> and, um, and then, of course, modern times, uh, good heavens, gross point blank. Uh, the, the, if you've ever seen that movie, mm -hmm. um, it's incredibly well put together and complicated. Um, all my students read Chinatown by Robert Towns. They all read uh, Body Heat by Larry Kasdan. Is that the Kathleen Turner? Kathleen Turner and William Hurt. I it's, watched it oh, last week. It's an homage to, <laughs> oh, my goodness. to Double Indemnity, the great oh, film my school goodness. of the 40s yes. and 50s. Yes. It's a fabulous the movie. The twist isn't it? is. Oh, it's unbelievable. Unbelievable. Yeah. And, um, and I had the great thrill once. Um, I went to graduate school at Southampton College, and um, they do the Southampton College Writers Conference every year there, or they did then. And um, uh, Kathleen Turner was a guest, and she and Alan Alda and, uh -uh. Roy, and Roy Schneider, 
um, from Jaws, they yeah. did a dramatization of a radio play on stage, and it was a great thrill. The chance oh. to meet her and see her oh. in action. And Their chemistry in that. It's unbelievable. When he crashes to the window, breaks the glass, remember that? Well, in narrative structure, uh, Joseph Campbell. Yeah, love Joseph Campbell. Joseph Campbell, study Joseph Campbell and Chris Vogler. There's a step in the hero's journey called crashing, crossing the first threshold, and I, and that's the that's the, the crossover from Act One to Act Two, mm -hmm. when the protagonist commits to this special journey of the film, mm -hmm. and in Body Heat, it's literally crossing the first threshold. He's standing there <laughs> looking through the window at her, and he picks up a lawn chair and throws it through the window. It's unbelievable. And goes in, and they're on the floor together. And it's it's amazing. And it's called, say it again, it's called cro Crossing the First Threshold. Cross, and which leads from Act 1 to Act 2, is that what you're saying? Yeah. And it's literally, in the case of Body Heat, a literal, literal threshold. Crash. He busts through a door. I love that. It's a moment. I mean, it I remember is. when I saw it in the theater, there was a audible gas oh, yeah. in the room. Oh, yeah. yeah. And there was when I was watching it at home by myself, too. It's just phenomenal. Their, their chemistry is just amazing. I mean, the act, the writing, everything in that movie. It's it's wonderful. It really it's is. It's wonderful. Really interesting. So, yeah, that, that's very enlightening. Um, going back, rewind just a second, you had talked about some of your titles. You said that I think maybe one of your publisher did dead mm -hmm. phone, the that was your yeah. editor or publisher or something. Yeah. How do you come up with titles? Ooh, again, and I used, again, this was a whole lecture in my, in my intro screenwriting uh, class at Watkins. The, the title of a movie or of a book, it's absolutely critical because that's your exposure to oh. an audience. That's the- It's your face. That's the number one marketing device. So um, a, 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 an evocative, unforgettable title is key. And boy, they're hard. And um, the, you know, the best ones really are, and I don't do this all the time, but the best ones kind of are short mm -hmm. and evocative. Uh, you know, I said about Roy you know, you, you look at the, the movie poster for Jaws, a one word title, Jaws, oh. and, a, and a girl in a bathing suit, and then the shark coming from, you know exactly oh. what you're getting into. No questions asked, yes. And, and well, I have done, and we can, I, I don't know how much time we've got left. Oh, we're, we're good. good. We're we, good. Can, we can go here in a little bit. But now that I've gotten those first six rights back, mm -hmm. and they're being republished by a small, yes. By, yes. By a small imprint, I've changed the title of a couple of them. Yes. Um, there was one in the middle called Chain of Fools, which was the third one, mm -hmm. fourth one, fourth one, I'm sorry. And I had been reading a whole lot of Raymond Chandler and mm -hmm. I was really immersing myself into dark film noir. Mm -hmm. And this is a, um, a, a novel that's particularly dark. Of the six, seven Harry James Denton novels, this is the darkest. Mm -hmm. And my editor, um, when he read the first draft, called me up and said, is this a direction you're going in permanently? <laughs> and I went, no, it's just, it's, a, it's an excursion. But it, it, it took place, and you're a Nashville native, so yes. you remember this, new people. But in the 70s and the 80s, Nashville was kind of wild west. Oh, yeah. You had out 8th Avenue near Douglas Corner and the reservoir, the reservoir mm -hmm. you had a strain of massage parlors. Oh, I totally remember it, yes. And, and then you had this outbreak of what's euphemistically called gentlemen's clubs yes. in Nashville, yes. which are strip clubs. Right, of course. And the, the, there was, the, Nashville was a body launching mm -hmm. city. And I had gotten my first job this was in, this is what inspired the book you're talking where ideas come from. I'm driving to work one day. Thomas Nelson is out by the airport. Yes. I'm on I-40 West, I-40 East, and I go by Second Avenue, and this is 83, 84, 
And there's a new billboard up that says, World's Largest Adult Bookstore, exit here. And I'm going, I'm on my way to the World's Largest Bible Publisher. Right. And I'm passing the World's Largest Adult Bookstore. There's a story here. Yes. And there was. And, and so I wrote this book, Chain of Pools. My editor wanted to, my editor wanted to uh, uh, change the title to keep it in tune with music themed. So he called it Chain of Fools. Well, there's a character in the book. Harry James Denton is a, a, used to be a newspaper reporter. You're right. And he's talking about a time when he used to go out to the penitentiary a lot to interview prisoners. Now, I used to teach at the penitentiary. That's where I got this background material. For four years, I taught creative writing. Through Watkins? No, just... through my own. Through, I just approached them, and I started teaching out there. Oh. And I taught creative writing. So I did that for four years. What is and I great? had this inmate writer who was very, very good. And he had been in prison for 25 or 30 years. Very good writer. And he finally got, and this is a sidebar, but he finally got cut loose on his life sentence under a federal mandate because the prisons in Tennessee were too crowded. So they started cutting the old guys loose because they're least likely to go out and cause trouble in theory. And this guy was paroled and was writing and had a job and a girlfriend. And six months later, was killed in a traffic accident uh, a month before his first free Christmas in 20-something oh, years. Oh, oh. But anyway, he was telling me this story about, and it's all in the book. I just, sometimes, you know, as somebody told me once, good writers copy, great writers steal. <laughs> and I I just, and Go I just, for it. And I just right. stole it. But he was telling me this story of, of an African American, uh, no, a guy out there who, who had one leg and he lost his leg in a motorcycle accident and he fell in love with a nurse at the medical facility who was um, an African American, um, I think, what's the political, little person. Mm -hmm, she, was, mm -hmm. she was small, she was a little person. And, they wound up getting involved with each other, and he was paroled. So they moved in together in a trailer in Mount Juliet, and they were drinking one night, and they got in a fight, and he beat her to death with his fake leg. No, this is not true. This is the truth. <clears throat> and Harry's talking to this guy going, you know, and he's talking about how some of the ways in which people fulfill human urges in prison says at one point, you know, how, how can people do this? And the inmate says to him, and this is what one of the inmates had said to me, hey man, nobody's chain lay straight. And I went, ooh, that's the title for my book. And the editor wouldn't let me do it. Oh. So when the book was republished, it's now called Nobody's Chain Lay Straight. Which is a thousand times more intriguing. Don't Thank you think chain of books? I mean, I, I get the music connection. It, it was but. a lot more fun. I cannot wait for I cannot wait to read this. That, what a story! Well, I want to know a little bit more about the prison thing. You would go down, go out there like once a week. Once a month. Once, once, a, once a week. Every once Monday a week. night. And this was a they could just volunteer. Yeah, to, yeah, they could sign up for the class. And uh, I had about a half a dozen guys, um, three or four of whom who took it really seriously. Um, one of them published a novel. Um, one of them published a couple of nonfiction memoirs. Another one published, you know, articles in cat. He loved cats, so he published cat <laughs> magazines. You know, but and all these guys out there at, at the walls, which was the old Tennessee State Prison, that they had yard cats. There were millions of cats out there because really? they kept the rat population down. Now, is this the old one that looks like a castle? Mm -hmm. Now, the, yes, which is what they used to call it, the castle. Yes, was that built as a prison? Mm -hmm. Because it looks like a castle. Yeah. It really does. And it was, it was, if you're up for another excursion. Oh, of course. Um, years later, I, I did it for four years, and then they closed the prison. They wanted me to go out to Riverbend, 
but by this time I was getting a little burnout. It was emotional. Oh, a I can only job. imagine. I can only imagine. But years later, there's a there's a writer that I'm very good friends with, a very fine writer in Virginia. Her name is Sharon McCrum, and um, you, if mystery fans oh, might know her. The, the Ned Burns film. But she um, she was coming to town for a book signing, and she said, "I'm doing a book signing at." the Davis kid or whatever it was back then. And she said, but I've made arrangements to interview a guy that's on death row. I want to see this guy. Actually, she said, I, I'm trying to make arrangements to interview this guy on death row, and I can't seem to get anybody. Do you still know anybody out there? And I said, sure. So I made a few phone calls, and the next thing I know, Sharon and I are getting a tour of River Bend Penitentiary, along with the author escort. So she interviews this guy. She has a great interview with him. We met the warden. He's taking us into his office, and he's he's showing us some things that are, you know, not stuff you see every day, like the skull cap they put on prisoners right before they execute them. Yeah. So so this he's given us. He said he wanted to a death row. Yeah. Okay. We'll do a death row, and. So he gets one of the officers out there to give us a guided tour, just the four of us. We go into death row, and there's old Sparky, as it's called, the electric chair. And he says to Sharon, you want to sit in it? And she said, okay, sure. So she sits in the electric chair, and he puts her in oh my the seat belts. And, and then he, the, the, the author escort that's with Sharon is this attractive woman who's very nice, Justine Beach, she's wonderful. And um, this guy clearly was enchanted by her. Yeah. And he said, would you like to sit down? So she sits down in the electric chair. So the two of them, and then he looks at me and goes, you wanna try it? And I said, sure, why not? So he sets me down in the electric chair and puts the cross, the five point harness on here. And he doesn't do my arms or my legs, but and he leans down in my ear to where they can't hear. And he says, you want to see what it really feels like? Excuse me. And I said, sure, why not? What? And in the back of the electric chair, it's wooden, there's a slat cut out on a bevel hinge. And it moves, you're sitting here facing that way. And the hinge goes like this. So he tightens up these straps. And then he goes in back. And he unhooks the bevel and he slams that slab forward and locks it. So I am immobile, can't breathe. You're, I, I, it's the most tightly strapped into anything I've ever been. And he leans down and said, can't breathe, can you? And I said, no, sir, not well. And he said, don't worry. At this point, you wouldn't be there much longer. <laughs> so I've been strapped in the electric chair and got to walk away. And I think I'd go for the lethal injection. <laughs> yeah, me too. Me too. Unbelievable. It was an adventure. That's amazing. Yes. Fine. Okay. Um, this is going by too fast. I'm having so much fun. Um, Is Harry James Denton your favorite character to write for? Uh, yes. He is. I mean, I've been doing him the longest. Exactly. Um, you know, but God willing, I'll keep doing it. If people keep reading them, um, I've got the eighth one is underway. Um, I don't know where I'll go with him long term. Um, there is a Swedish writer, Henning Monkholm. And I, if you're if you're a fan of Swedish mysteries, you know who he is. I missed that one, but I'll he's check him out. And he has a series character that's been very successful. It was made into a Swedish television series that ran for over a decade. And I watched it subtitled in Swedish. That's oh my goodness, was. yes. And then Kenneth Branagh did a, an oh. adaptation for BBC, which in my view was not as effective, but it was still good. But um, 
in in the Henny Mockle novels, um, he, there's like 19 or 20 of them, and he wanted to bring it to a close, so he did something that I'd never seen a writer do before, which is two or three books before the anticipated end of the series. You start noticing that his series character, whose name just escaped me, Henny Mockle, wrote the, um, and I, I'm sorry, I'm embarrassed, I forgot. Don't be, don't be. But he, he wrote, you start to notice there's something wrong with the character. There's something, something's not right with him. And that goes on for two or three books, and in the last book we discover his Alzheimer's. And in the very last murder mystery oh he solves goodness. is right before his Alzheimer's becomes full blown. Now, I'm not going to do that with Harry. No, but it's but, an but interesting it's a, it's way. A, it's, an, it's a very interesting way. Interesting way. Because it's kind of in so the, life. In the so very life. last book, Harry is almost retirement age, and his daughter, who has become a police officer as well, mm -hmm. has to help him get through his last case. And at the last case, he, re he takes a medical retirement. Yes. And at the end of the book, you know, he's this is pretty rapid onset stuff. So, so is Harry, would he, is he in his 60s now? Harry's approaching 60. Approaching I don't have him 60. be 60. But uh, I had great fun. Uh, you'll, you'll know you're, if you're reading Death Book. The first six books, Harry is so broke. He's yes. always yes. broke. Yes. Yes. He's lucky. He's lost his job. He's divorced. Yes. He's trying to make a living as a private detective. And the only reason, the reason he's surviving is he gets repo work from his best buddy. Lonnie. Lonnie, who's <laughs> yeah. a wonderful character. I love Lonnie, I and love Lonnie. At the end of the first six books, which I'm sort of thinking is the first cycle, little spoiler alert, not much, but Harry and his girlfriend, the, the uh, Marsha, they, I, mean, I hate to give it away, but you'll, it's broad gonna, brushstrokes. Yeah, you go broad brushstrokes. Mm -hmm. They get involved with each other for four or five books. Then they hit a bad spot and they start to break up as relationships do. <laughs> Imagine. And then at the last minute, Marcia discovers she's pregnant. She's lost her job in a political scandal which comes several yes. months from where you are. And she decides to go home to, to her family. She has a little bit of family mm -hmm. left. She has an aunt who lives in Reno, Nevada. So she goes out to Reno. Reno. She leaves Nashville. And at the last minute, she calls Harry and says, I'm having this baby in another week. I want you here. So he goes out to Reno and gets involved in a murder mystery out of there. Of course. Of course. And solves it. And at the end of the book, he's there for the birth of his daughter. It's very sweet. And it was, it was a scene that, candidly, made me cry and I have trouble reading it to this day without getting choked up because it was I wrote it before I became a parent but history kind of repeated itself I became a parent mm -hmm. about a year after writing that book and so when I started teaching and 15 years go by without a Harry I had to figure out how I was going to bring him back yes. and I thought why not just fast forward 15 years I love it. And come come up with a, a, a reason that we haven't seen Harry, which is that when he becomes a parent, and, and I can speak personally, that when you become a parent, it gets your attention. Yeah, thank Suddenly, <laughs> things like making a living, health insurance, mm -hmm. some kind of stability in your life. So Harry comes back to Nashville, this is the backstory, just as Lonnie is starting this computer security company. Lonnie's a computer geek. Well, they start this computer security company. Harry gets in on the ground floor. So for 15 years, he's a corporate security executive. And then Lonnie sells the company, which Harry now owns a piece of because there was no money in the beginning. So Harry paid everybody, Lonnie paid everybody in stock. So the company sold. Harry's about to turn 60, and he's richer than he ever imagined he would be in his life. He is stinking bloody rich. 
He is rich, the kind of money you can't get rid of if you try. And he doesn't know what to do, right? So then, uh, again, through a chain of events, Harry becomes a single, a, single, a single parent. And his daughter moves from uh, Reno <coughs> to Nashville to live with him. And he becomes a single parent to a teenage daughter in his late 50s. Yeah. So. Oh my goodness. And, and then, this book is called um, Fade Up from Black. Because okay. it's a murder mystery set in a film school. Love it. And Perfect title. Thank you. And um, it, what happens is Harry's kind of at loose ends. They're shutting the company down that, that has been sold. He's getting involved in another business. But basically, he doesn't have to worry anymore, which would be a sweet place to be. Wouldn't it, though? But it causes him some problems. He doesn't know what to do with himself. Um, he and his teenage daughter are very close. They have a very good relationship. But she goes to a private school out Highway 100 that I made up. Yeah, certainly there's nothing out Highway 100. No problem. No. There are no private schools at Highway 100. No, no. It's, 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 it's like if you picked up Ensworth and made another one down here. Right. That's where she would go to school. Of course. Of that's course. where she would go to school. And so um, he gets this, uh, one of my favorite goofy film noirs is, is an Edmund O'Brien movie called, and I don't want to tell you, I just forgot the name of it, DOA. Have you ever heard of DOA? I don't think so. so Have you seen I, it? I don't think I know. It's, 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 the, 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 it's a classic film noir from the late 40s. It might be the early 50s. I used to teach it. And Edmund O'Brien is the protagonist. And at the opening of the movie, he's really sick. He's not doing well at all. And he walks into a police department and says, I want to speak to somebody about a homicide. And he says, okay, I'm a homicide detective. What can I do? He said, I want to report a murder. And the detective says, okay, who's murder? And Edmund O'Brien says, mine. And I, I just love that. It's the open. Yeah, yeah I love I'm that. Sorry. It's a goofy movie. It is. It's a. It's a really, in many ways, a goofy movie. But but what? Uh, that's a great. That, that's, that's a great, great premise. Yes. So I have a guy walking into Harry's office saying, "You're a private detective." He said, "Well, I used to be. I'm not anymore." He said, "Well," and the guy says, "Well, I used to follow your cases, and you used to be a newspaper reporter. You were a, a good. You were a really good newspaper reporter. You covered politics." And Harry's thinking, "Oh, is this guy a stalker or what?" Yeah. And he said, yeah, but that's a long time ago. That's a couple of careers ago. I don't do that anymore. And, and the guy said, well, I want to hire you as a private detective. And Harry said, for what? And he said, I want you to investigate a murder. And Harry says, if there's a murder, you need to go to the police. And the guy said, no, nope, this is, you got to do this. And Harry said, okay, whose murder is it? And the guy says, mine. I'm going to be dead soon. And Harry blows him off. Because he, he thinks the guy's nuts. Of course, of course. And so, and then the guy winds up being killed. He winds up being murdered. And Harry's guilt-ridden, so he decides to solve the murder. And is this the one? In, in, the in new one. This is the, the this newest, is the newest one. one. This is the one that came out last year. And, and it's, what's the title of it again? It's called Fade, to, Fade Up oh, from, from Black. Black. That's right, Fade Up from Black. Which is a loosely adapted film writing. Right, film, exactly. You know? So... Um, and of course, again, this is a little bit of a sidebar, but I wrote, this book came about um, in January of 2020. The Watkins College of Art and Design and the Watkins Film School went under after 135 years. Unbelievable. And I've been there 25 of those 35 years, and the college just collapsed. They ran out of money. So, what a shame. It was. It was a very. It was a, a difficult lot of time. Was there. Oh it was yes. A difficult, painful time, and those of us who'd been there for a long time knew it was coming. We knew it. I'm sure that though you look over all those years and think how many students you've influenced, they how were, many you've mentored, how they, many you've helped. They were wonderful, and that and it, it's so weird it, because you get it's it's a very conflicted. Um, people have this myth that 
college teaching is somehow glamorous. That, you know, you're a college professor and you teach a couple of classes a week. Right. And then in the summertime, you go to conferences in exotic places. Right. And you hobnob with your fellow wizards. Right. <laughs> At Woody Allen kind of parties. Yeah. Yeah. Intellectual. To college teaching is a ruthless grind these days. Um, if you're at a top-notch university where you make a lot of money and they have a lot of money, that's one thing. But for most people teaching in small colleges, community colleges, independent colleges, uh, it, there's, there's, there aren't enough, there's not enough money, there's not enough students. Um, we Five or six years ago, there was an article in the New York Times about the future of higher ed in America. And higher ed, we're in trouble. Uh, this guy wrote that there would be 15 to 20 colleges a year closing in America for the indefinite future. We have too many colleges and not enough warm bodies to keep them open. And, you know, a college like Watkins, which was had very little endowment, um, they didn't have a whole lot of money. They were in a weird position legally because they were a, the, the the will that created Watkins right. said that they were a ward of the state, which means the state controlled the college. The governor appoints three commissioners, but we're not a line item in the UT system. So we don't get any money from the state. They don't get any support from the state or regular support. Yeah. So, um, you know, the college was limited in what it could do, resources. It was a, I, if I had it to do all over again, candidly, it would have been a difficult choice to take the job. The pay's terrible. I'm sure. The fringe benefits were terrible. I was constantly scrambling for extra, I mean, I taught at Belmont, I taught it. I taught at Belmont adjunct in their film program. I taught film at Vanderbilt as an adjunct. Um, I taught at uh, TSU and Nashville State mm -hmm. Community College just trying to cobble together a living while writing at the same time. So that was that was a, a weird transition. And I decided to get it out of my system by writing a murder mystery set in a film school. Fabulous. Well, you have been fantastic. You, oh, I, I've been sitting here all night. We thank can go you. on for, for a while. I, I, I only want 17 more hours every time, is that okay? That's what, that works. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. We've been with Stephen Womack, as I, as I said earlier, writer extraordinaire. And uh, we just thank you so much for your thank time. Thank you. It's a pleasure. I have a million more questions. I'd love to talk to you at length at any time. We'll do that. Thank you so much. Thank you. It's been great. Thanks.